For observers outside the environmental world or who are not involved in this discussion, it might strike you as somewhat surprising how controversial something like rewilding has become. The principle of minimising human management in areas of countryside, allowing natural processes to reclaim them, provokes quite intense passions. We've been observing it, we've been writing about it, and we really wanted to do an event to get to the bottom of it. Um, I should say that Unheard, despite the agricultural pun in our name, does not actually have a position on rewilding. <laughs> uh, we are rewilding agnostic, and I look forward to learning. Cowards. I look forward to learning this evening <laughs> as much as you. We've brought together to have this conversation the names that we think are most associated with each side of this debate. Both nature lovers, in different ways, they have themselves crossed swords on social media, even recently, and also on the pages of Unheard. Ben Goldsmith is a financier and environmentalist. He has become one of the most prominent and perhaps controversial advocates of rewilding. He is practising what he preaches in the process of rewilding hundreds of acres of his own farm in Somerset. Last year, he published his memoir, God is an Octopus, Love, loss and a calling to nature, which explored how taking solace in rebounding nature helped him comprehend the death of his teenage daughter. John Lewis Stemple is one of the best known writers on farming and nature in, we would say, the English language. His columns in Country Life and The Times, his multiple best-selling books, have won many awards and he too practices what he preaches. It was, I can tell you, quite hard to persuade him to leave his farm in the southwest of France and come here. We did multiple attempts, but we actually managed finally to get him here. So thank you, John. Please welcome both of our debaters this evening. Um, so we're not the Oxford Union. We're not doing ultra formal debate styles, but we do think we should start off with a a kind of little mini speech statement of intent from each debater. So we've got a, a lectern and everything. Our topic has sort of two tiers. The, the question on the poster, bring back the wolves, is where we're going to start because it's a very good way into the heart of this debate. And our hope is that over the course of the conversation, it will widen to cover the broader questions associated with rewilding. We're going to try, just before I hand over to our first speaker, to take a preliminary vote to see if there is any movement in the audience over the course of the discussion. If I say, should we bring back the wolves? Basically, answer yes, raise your hands. OK, if you um, feel... I might know what it feels like to be a lamb led to the slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> if you feel negative about the idea of bringing back the wolves, please raise your hand. This is a very even audience, I think. We could, this is like a, a question time session. It's sort of hand selected by you, Gov. <laughs> I would say maybe slightly fewer. So the balance of the room is in favour of bringing back the wolves, but not by a huge amount. And second question to raise your hands on is rewilding in general. Do you feel positively about it? Raise your hands if you feel positively about rewilding. If you feel negatively about rewilding, please raise your hand. That's, I would say, six, five or six. Very good. Well, so it's an uphill task. It's an, it's an uphill task. Let me begin by inviting Ben Goldsmith to make the case to bring back the wolves. Well, thanks so much, Freddie, and thanks so much, John, for, for inviting me to do this. Something fascinating is happening for someone like me. I've grown up, many of you in, your, in this room, with a real deep love of wildlife and nature. Sort of inconceivable 10 years ago that we'd have been gathered in a room in Westminster to debate things like wolves or any kind of wildlife or rewilding topic. But there's been some kind of upwelling of love for the natural world in the last five or eight years. Now, this has become a big, big topic. And it's not just a growing understanding on the part of ordinary people as to the need we have for nature in, a pra in practical terms. So the, the link between the flooding of towns like Keswick and Buckfastley and the utter denudity you see on the hills above them. The, the link between a degraded environment and a degraded quality of life and so on but also this idea that we need nature in a much more visceral way that perhaps is harder to articulate. You know, anyone in this room who's been ill or unhappy or who's been grieving knows that a little bit of time spent in nature makes you feel better. It makes us feel good. No one understands this better than farmers, of course. It's why farmers are so attached to what they do. It's why they love the land. It's why they love their lives. They, they know that, that that connection with nature is 
viscerally important to their lives. And it's, we're mesmerized by nature. It's, if you sit at the edge of a pond and you see countless interactions, little creatures hunting each other and chasing each other, the dragonflies above the water, patterns overlaid on patterns, overlaid on patterns. It's, it's mesmerizing. And it's, um, it's therefore interesting to me that alongside this growing realization of the importance of nature, people have started to understand that we've been really fobbed off as to what nature's meant to be. Now, we live in arguably one of the most nature-depleted countries on Earth. You know, the list of species that we've lost, the, 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 the list of landscapes that are just totally depleted, even if they've got monikers like National Park or Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, is really immense. You know, if a foreigner would not recognize our national parks to, to be national parks. Um, and, and, and that's borne out in the numbers. You know, virtually every species you care to look at, with the exception of kind of wood pigeons and crows, has declined catastrophically in recent decades. Well, people are waking up to that. They know that our national parks are a bit shit. They just know it. And meanwhile, something equally remarkable is happening across the water in Europe. The resurgence of wildlife from the continent of Europe is one of the great conservation success stories of the last few decades massive increases in species of all kinds, including the more difficult to live with species, the so-called keystone species, things like beavers back from near extinction. There's probably two or three million beavers now in Western Europe alone. Wolves, even bison, an animal was down to 20 animals or or fewer. There's now 10,000 bison living in different European countries. The national park landscapes of Western Europe are suddenly thrumming with life. The Apennines in Italy, the Cantabrian mountains of Spain, nature nature tourism is booming. What's happened? Well, what's happened is that the keystones are back. This idea of keystone species, it's derived from a medieval architectural term. Every medieval bridge had a keystone under each arch. Rip out the keystone, the arch collapses. And we know that all species have their role to play, but some are disproportionately important. And these are the keystones. Take them out and the arch collapses. And this is exactly what's happened in Britain's remoter landscapes. We've lost our keystones, and that's why we see the degradation that we see. The keystones being the native cattle, you know, the originally wild cattle, more recently native cattle, highland cattle in Scotland, disappeared with a lot of the indigenous people of the uplands of Britain. Native cattle is incredibly important for grazing and browsing and trampling and making sure that you don't get a dark, barren, closed canopy forest. You get a semi-open mosaic woodland that's rich in wildflowers and scrub, songbirds and so on. Cattle are a vital keystone. Well, they've gone from most of our national parks, been replaced by hordes of sheep, 30 million, 40 million non-native sheep in Britain. Uh, Second being the beaver. The beaver holds water in the landscape. Without beavers, our landscapes lose the ability to act like a sponge and hold water. Beavers build little dams along the creeks and streams of our watersheds. And when it rains, the water stays there. And these ribbon wetlands created by beavers are so rich in wildlife, they might be our richest habitats in this country. Well, beavers are now making a recovery across Europe. In Britain, too, finally, with with some controversy, they're back. Uh, Thirdly, the wild boar, nature's gardener, or the domestic pig. We don't run pigs in the form of pannage anymore through the woods, but wild wild boar and native pigs are nature's gardeners. They turn the soil. They create bare areas of earth for plants like poppies and scarlet pimpernel and cornflowers to germinate, trees like black poplar, European aspen, willow, trees that really have been eradicated from Britain because they can't germinate in the grass. They have to germinate on bare earth, nature's gardener. And finally, the wolf. In the absence of wolves, you get an explosion in the number of wild ungulates, deer in particular, but also wild boar. Scotland is way beyond carrying capacity of deer. Any more than two to three deer per square kilometre, and you get zero growth in new baby trees. Zero. Some parts of Scotland have got 20 deer per square kilometre. I think the average is somewhere between 15 and 20. That's 10 times more deer than the land can hold. And come down to places like East Anglia, where we grow all our food, an enormous amount of crop damage on account of just huge flocks of deer, herds of deer, completely out of control. Hunters can't stay on top of them. The wolf is the forest guardian. It's the mountain's guardian. Without wolves, you get a complete imbalance. Imagine if Though we saw a headline, Sri Lanka announces a plan to kill 70% of its leopards. You'd be horrified. Or Belize, 70% of its jaguars. Well, that's what Switzerland's doing. We're killing 70% of their wolves in in Switzerland. Sweden, too. Is France going to follow? We don't know. The challenge is not to kill these things off, these things that are hard to live with and kill off these keystones. The challenge is to find coexistence and to reinsert ourselves back into the miracle of nature rather than endlessly fighting against it. So my view is we need to figure it out and live with wolves.
John. <laughs> Goodness. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, obviously, I thought as I'm, I'm a farmer, um, I should wear tweed. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't wish to disappoint expectations. You would not believe how different our views are going to be. I actually originally refused to do this talk, basically um, because you will, as I will say in a moment, I think rewilding as a conservation strategy gets way too much of the oxygen and publicity, and there are alternative conservation strategies. So I wasn't going to do this on that basis. But Freddie, and I'm heard very persuasive, but also <clears throat> I talked to family and friends who are sheep farmers, and they persuaded me that someone should put the case for sheep farmers. And here I am in a fold, it seems to me, for the wolves. <laughs> so, wolves, extraordinary animals. Although, of course, no more extraordinary in nature than the wood pigeon sitting in St. James's Park. A wood pigeon can produce something akin to mammalian milk. You'll get my point immediately. The excitement of some humans but rewilding's favourite chosen animals, currently the wolf and the lynx, charismatic animals always, is no more than that. It's just human excitement. The wolf has no greater part to play in nature than the humble earthworm. Nature is actually indifferent. Which leads to this obvious problem. A principal proposed reason, as you've heard from Ben, for the reintroduction of the wolf into the Scottish Highlands is that it will predate the deer herds, which do indeed overgraze. Has anyone asked the wolf its opinion on this? Is it not just a human arrogance to assume that cho an animal chosen by you will fulfil a programme that you actually have as a human, to do your bidding in a scheme you conjure? Wolves are smart. And as apex predators, what they do is basically seek the easiest meat for the least expenditure of effort. And so they head, by old tradition, to the sheepfold. I live and farm in France these days, where the current conclusion of the French government agency INRE, after 30 years of attempted reintroduction of the wolf, this is how disastrously it has gone. They have realised that the wolves, being so smart, have, quote, probably taken advantage of their legal status <laughs> as a strictly protected species, i.e. they have become blasé about humans. And they actually managed to get through and over every security measure put up against them in farming communities. And this can actually include eight-foot-high electric fences. And now it is discovered that the wolves do not mind getting electric shock as they go through and seize the sheep. So, the moment in France, there are currently between 12,000 and 15,000 attacks on livestock per annum, mostly on sheep. And then you actually get the culling of the wolves. The French government is now intending to shift the annual cull up from 10% to 19% because the situation is so bad. You're proposing to introduce a wolf into Britain, a place with 60 million people, motorways, and the vast majority of its land is agriculture, the agriculture which feeds us. There's no safe room for the wolf. In the agricultural West, you cannot talk about wolves without talking about sheep. Wolves and sheep, it's there in the idiom, the wolf in sheep's clothing. Sometimes, by the way, I think you have to question the ethics of a rewilding scheme which reintroduces animals for those animals to be killed because they will be killed in culls because the wolf is being reintroduced into a time no longer its own. The wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, if you happen to be a British sheep farmer, the wolf hiding here 
in tonight's debate is rewilding. It's a conservation strategy widely thought by sheep farmers actually to be a programme for their removal from the rural scene. If the sheep go, and people tweet such things as the sheep must go because they are the principal obstacle to reintroduce reintroduction of the wolf, well, when the sheep farmers go, you're going to be knocking a hole in the social structure of the countryside. And what are you going to end up with eventually, do you think? I think you're going to end up with probably a theme park of rewilded animals from bygone days. See, the question of the wolf is also a question of people. It's sheep versus wolf. It's also totemic. I think, as I said earlier, there's actually a small tragedy in tonight's debate, which is the topic itself. Out there in the Thames, the eel population has declined by 99% in this century alone. Okay? Swifts are down by 30-40%. The brown hare is locally extinct. We have lost arable flowers, but here we are. And so, uh, soil, the actual building stuff of nature, runs off East Anglian fields by tonnes per acre per annum, and that is the building block of life and nature. We can't save what we have, but rewilders wish to reintroduce the wolf. It will come at vast expense. It is also socially divisive. Or, I'm going to suggest, for a very limited, if any limited, overall gain for nature. Rewilding the wolves, as I say, I think it's an oxygen-sucking diversion from nature's actual needs. I will now declare my vested interest. <clears throat> my family began farming 800 years ago and supplied the Tudor court with the wool it preferred above all others for its undergarments. We put the leggings on royalty. Ben, what is your... Initial response to what you've heard from John. Well, I'd, I'd first like to point out that wolves have never, in fact, been reintroduced anywhere in Europe. They've spread back naturally from relic populations that managed to cling on in the face of centuries of persecution in places like the Italian Apennine Mountains and so on. So wolves have recovered. They haven't been reintroduced. And if it wasn't for the English Channel, they'd be back here. Um, the, the idea that they're a problem for people or that they feel uncomfortable living around people is also a myth. The cities of Madrid, Paris, Amsterdam, Luxembourg and a host of others have wolves living within the political precincts of those cities. So you can, you can pop out of Luxembourg, 15-minute taxi, you can sit on a restaurant veranda, you get given a pair of binoculars, I've done it myself, and if you're lucky, you will watch wolves at the edge of the woodland half a mile away while you have your dinner. So wolves are perfectly comfortable living around people. There hasn't been a fatality as a result of someone attacked and killed by a wolf this century, last century in Europe. It, it, people are not the issue. They do kill sheep. We know that they kill sheep. But in terms of numbers, in 2022... As John pointed out, wolves killed 15,000 livestock, mostly sheep, in France. That's 1 20th of 1% of the sheep in France. 1 20th. 200 times more sheep, in other words, 10% of the population, died of natural causes in France during the same year. So exposure on wet, cold hillsides, worms, parasites, foxes, crows picking out the eyes of lambs and all those other things. Sheep are not even a rounding... The death at the hands of wolves is not even a rounding error, and every single one was generously compensated by the state. John, I can see us getting exercised by this. <laughs> I think we need to let you speak. Ben is right in the case of France, that the wolves came over the border, but actually their expansion through France was actually promoted by the Macron government, which is currently paying £30 million a year in compensation and um, me protective measures which is not a fraction of the cost, actually, that farmers are bearing. One farmer was compensated €1,250 for a £28,000 loss. I, as a sheep farmer, I cannot believe that people could consider a sentient animal just something that's a, a statistic. That's not how farmers relate to their livestock, you know. I do not consider my livestock to be some sort of Cartesian flesh robot that I can lose them, just be replaced by others. These are sentient animals. They deserve our respect, they deserve our care. Um, so also I have to say, 
you know, if you lose part of your flock, you have to replace that. But your flock might have taken years to build up. Yeah, it's an effort from your, from your family, from your, you know, and it's actually really, really difficult to actually rebuild a flock if you lost part of it because you just can't bring in new sheep because they're all the same. They aren't. Could I just ask, as a as the, the the normie in this conversation, what's each of your end goal here? Would I mean, if John, do you want to have no wolves in France? Do you want to have them in particular? Parts with with high fences. What's the happy state? Okay, um, so Ben is absolutely right. And I think I said the my, same thing myself. Which is the part of the problem is that the wolves have actually lost their fear of humanity. So they are a real problem in farming communities in France. You actually have to live, in effectively, you know, in kind of like sort of compounds. And then you have the livestock guardian dogs, which are actually a problem in themselves. Because as the French tourist industry is now finding out, they like to approach and menace anything that comes their way, including the walkers. The dogs bark all the time. So what sheep farmers now find is that their livestock guardian dogs, which are meant to be protecting the flock, bark all night and annoy the neighbours. So now you're getting social division in villages. How many wolves in the... There are a thousand thousand wolves in in France. Do you want any wolves in France? OK, I think there is probably only one solution for the wolves in France where we have them. You haven't even got an idea yet what the wolves are going to do to a sheep community in Britain because the French system is actually a tighter um, flock system of control, unlike the, uh, what, the sheep farming in Britain. So what I'm actually saying is basically this is the reality of living with wolves Headlines like this all the time. So no wolves, that's the question. Would there be no wolves in your world? I think, actually, after 30 years, okay, there's probably only one solution, which is their eradication in livestock areas and that they are confined to certain agreed areas of the countryside. There is no peaceful coexistence. That's, That's a clear answer. Let me just ask the same question to you then, Ben. What's the goldsmith vision for England? Are we just going to have wolves everywhere? You described how they're going to be intermingled in cities. Are we going to? Is Milton Keynes going to be have? Wolves so, so, so my, my overall vision is that we have the species that we have chosen to eradicate in the past back in our landscapes, and that's all of the species that would be here if it wasn't for the English Channel, including wolves. So yes, I'd have wolves back, and I'd be pretty relaxed as to where they end up. And it's 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 not honest to say that farmers hate wolves. If you look at, for example, Spain, which is a place that I've read up in advance of this. Yes, sheep farmers have a problem with wolves, but not all sheep farmers. I've got some polling to quote in a second. Arable farmers, anyone growing crops, anyone growing vines, anyone growing fruit, veg, anyone with pigs is strongly in favour of the return of wolves because wolves control wild boar numbers. One family of wolves in Cantabria, which was studied by scientists, killed 50 wild boar in one year. And the wild boar, of course, is a swine fever risk for for pigs. So the, the farming community is actually divided on this. But I just want to quote Eurogroup for Animals, which is a large EU-based group, which surveyed tens of thousands of people in 10 countries in 2023, rural population only across 10 EU countries. 72% of rural people in 10 countries said large carnivores deserve their place in the EU. 68% said the strict protection of large carnivores need to be maintained. Just 10% said that the presence of large carnivores is non-essential as a component in the EU's natural landscape. And finally, 61% of sheep farmers across 10 countries in the EU support strict protection of large carnivores. Meanwhile, in Belgium, which is where this study originated across 10 countries... They halved, between 2021 and 2023, they halved the number of sheep killed by wolves. The number was already pitiful. It wasn't 0.02% as it is in France, but it was still pitiful as a percentage of total sheep. So you're, you're actually, your contention is that the farming community would be on your side? So I don't consider it a mad idea that we would have wolves in East Anglia, let's say, a place where crop damage is mounting every single year, huge herds of fallow deer, hunters totally unable to stay on top of it, I don't think it's crazy to think that we can live alongside white-tailed eagles and wolves and lynx and wild boar. I think it's our duty as civilised people to find harmony with wildlife. Sri Lanka is an island the size of Ireland. They've got four times more people, 20 million people in Sri Lanka. They live alongside 1,000 leopards, 6,000 elephants. They figure it out. It's not easy. It's difficult. All wildlife is a nuisance. The bloody pine martins get in and kill my chickens, which drives me mad. Foxes hedgehogs will eat uh, partridge eggs. 
All wildlife, the seals are a problem for salmon farmers. There's 50,000 seals around the coast. Do we eradicate them as well? Name me a single thing more charismatic than a blue tit that isn't a nuisance in one way or another. We have to figure it out and figure out how to live with these species. And I would argue that the wolf is far less of a problem than people make out. We're talking about minuscule sheep losses, and that's it. John. Ben, you know as well as I do that wolves do not only attack sheep, for instance. So any member of the EU you can think of who lost her pony? who particularly like eating dogs as well. Ben, one question. OK. Wolves introduced into the Scottish Highlands, OK, to predate the deer. By most estimates, the deer, red deer population alone needs to be brought down from 400,000 deer to about 133,000 deer. How many wolves is that going to take, given that the most one wolf is going to eat is probably between 30 and 50 deer per year. I mean, my maths is terrible, but you're talking about thousands of wolves to make any impact on the deer population. You're absolutely right. Wolves will not do the job on their own. We need to continue hunting deer and we need to keep on eating venison. But much more important than controlling the numbers of deer is the way that wolves control the behavior of deer. I urge people in the audience to watch a short four-minute film on YouTube, which has been watched 100 million times, called How Wolves Change Rivers. Deer, in the absence of fear, in the absence of wolves, like to hang about on the edge of the river and eat the succulent riparian herbage that grows there. When there are wolves around, they don't want to be ambushed, so they scarper back up to the escarpments, back up to the hills. And the, 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 it's called Ecology of Fear, the change in behavior among grazing animals is far more important in reinvigorating nature in a landscape where wolves exist than the reduction in numbers. So we are also a keystone species. We also have to hunt deer. Can I, I'm just keen that we broaden the discussion a little bit beyond just the wolf, because we could disappear down <laughs> statistics and policies here. It feels like there are some big values clashes going on. I, John, as a sort of audience member of this, uh, ben has the, the advantage over you in the kind of lyrical language states because it, it's a very romantic vision. It sounds like wolves and all of these exotic species back. It sounds cool, basically. Um, and it's, it's an aesthetic, romantic vision of nature. <laughs> How do you reclaim that to your side of the argument? Well, what I think I'm going to say is something much more controversial than that, which is this is actually a culture war. What it seems like to rural communities is that the imposition of wolves on them is a kind of form of um, green elites telling them what to do. There are a lot of rural communities which I would say are deeply suspicious um, of the proposed introduction of wolves. When the Scottish National Union of Farmers was polled, there approval rating for the reintroduction of wolves was minus 16%, i.e. they were so much against it that it barely could be got onto the scale. Ben's implacable problem is he's actually going to have to persuade rural communities, sheep farming communities in Scotland that wolves are a good idea. Scottish rural communities, having talked to them before I come here, are also deeply suspicious, indeed, of the whole rewilding thing. What it actually looks like is a kind of programme for green lads um, to set up kind of eco-Disney theme parks. I am now going to read you something that Ben wrote. Here's Ben in his role as financier addressing potential investors in Guernsey last year. What we need to do is make rewilding in its broadest possible definition an asset class. An estate in Scotland is now an asset for which you can reasonably expect to generate an income, a predictable 30-year income from voluntary carbon alone. Look at the buyers for land in Scotland now. And that throws up political issues of course, the Scottish people are frightened about investment firms from Guernsey buying up their land, but that's all manageable. I think it would be fair to say that most people's perception of rewilding is not that it's a financial tool. Mm. Ben? I think it's important to, to 
differentiate between which rural people are concerned about nature recovery, species reintroductions, and so on. We're specifically talking about sheep. Sheep is overwhelmingly the dominant activity in the British uplands, save the Scottish highlands, where overwhelmingly the activity is rich landowners who do deer stalking and driven grouse. So you have very large sporting estates interspersed with sheep farms, more or less, in the British uplands. Sheep are the number one cause of the loss of rural villages, rural communities over the last 500 years in Britain. Since Tudor times, it was rich people buying land, clearing villages in the form of the highland clearances in order to make way for very large sheep branches. It's well documented. My mother's own ancestor, the Duke of Sutherland, drove his tenants to the west coast of Scotland and ultimately across the Atlantic in order to clear the land so he could have vast numbers of sheep. They cut the trees, sold the timber to the Navy and filled the land with sheep. That's how the numbers of sheep over 200 years inflated by 80 fold. Then, of course, the price of wool collapsed. Today, sheep represent less than 1% of the total calories produced in this country, total food produced. Sheep are not relevant in, an, in a food security sense. They're also not producing livelihoods that people want to live. The average age of sheep farmers in the English uplands, I don't know for Scotland and Wales, is now 72. People don't want to do it. The, the average net um, earnings of a sheep farmer in the English uplands is less than £8,000, which is far beneath the living wage. It simply doesn't work. And 80 to 90% of the revenues of sheep farmers in England is taxpayer subsidies. So we're subsidising an industry which is stripping our national parks of nature and not providing a decent or dignified living to anyone anymore. But if you only need to go back three or four generations and these same communities had a diversity of stuff going on, they were harvesting fuel from the common land, uh, fruit and berries, they would have had geese, they would have had ponies, they'd have had n mostly native cattle. In Wales, the dominant livestock in, the, in 1800 was native cattle, which are, of course, a native species. So my proposition is that a wilder way of farming is the surest pathway to economic and social renewal in these terribly deprived landscapes. Can I just, just to push the, the point that John makes, I thought it was well made. It does fit into the culture war. And I completely recognise what you say. So I, I just want to know what your response is yeah. to that, that it, it will feel to a lot of people. We've seen the, the tractors on the streets of Berlin, in Amsterdam, across Spain. At the moment, there is a sense that the green movement is rich, fancy people in faraway cities having picturesque ideas about nature, not knowing much of the detail of farming, and that you get this kind of, you know, from high on low yeah. visions. How... Is that true? I think it's absurd to suggest that rewilding nature recovery or wolves are responsible for the decline of sheep farming in our uplands, whether that's Britain or in Europe. It, it's global economic factors which are causing a decline in the price of wool. It simply isn't a business model that works. And mostly no one wants to do it. I bet there's not a person in this room really that wants to derive their entire livelihood from being a benighted shepherd in a, on a hillside somewhere. You know, it's no one wants to do it anymore. In Spain, people don't want to do it. And as a result, you see the loss of livestock in the landscape. And in the absence of any keystone grazers, you get this great growth of, of pines and, and, and closed canopy forests. You lose the grasslands, you lose the mosaics, you get much more volatility in terms of... What are the farmers going to do? So I th at the moment, they're leaving the land. They're simply not able to do it anymore in a way that is economically viable. So irrespective of rewilding, irrespective of wolves, sheep farming in our national park and upland landscapes is disappearing. Land is being abandoned. And that's exactly what will happen in Britain as well, whether we like it or not. What rewilding offers is a way for them to stay in the land by farming in the way that their ancestors farmed, with heavy native cattle, maybe some ponies, with high-speed broadband so they can do other things, maybe some support in creating an, a, a b and uh, with, with a bunch of economic activities going on. Yeah, that's the answer. In John, my this, is, this not, is this a pragmatic worldview that all, we're hearing? All, all farming is subsidised. Okay. I mean, Ben could, you know, we could talk about farmers in East Anglia a bit, couldn't we? They're all subsidised. The fact that sheep farmers are subsidised means nothing at all. All farming is subsidised. It's all a bonfire of the sanity. What I would say back to you, first of all, is why do rewilders use such emotive language about sheep farming, like sheep wrecking, that sheep are a white plague? OK. George Monbiot saying that sheep are woolly maggots. Could you understand, perhaps, if a sheep farming community... and, and Ben's picture of sheep farming in Britain is, shall we say, generous to his point of view, because I know so many hundreds of sheep farmers. And when Ben said last year 
in the mail that sheep farming could go. I have to say, I have never been so in, you know, inundated with people telling me that um, it might be better if Ben went, frankly. See, what it feels like, using language like that, Ben, is it seems like a kind of demonisation, yeah? So if we're ever going to get anywhere, I think, on this, I think language probably, you know, from my side too, is actually going to have to change. One question, Ben. Are sheep necessary for floral diversity, for biodiversity in the uplands? So I, th I think John makes a good point on language. I mean, in defence of George Monbiot in particular, he has moved the Overton window and made it acceptable to question th things that have previously been unquestionable. You know, sheep on a chocolate box in the Yorkshire Dales have been something that, that, that you simply cannot criticise, and I think that has now changed. Are sheep necessary, I think? So are they necessary? In the context of conservation, I think there are some niche scenarios in which sheep are a good thing. So I, there is a tradition of Herdwick sheep in the Lake District that are hefted in particular hillsides and particular fells. With, there's a thing of beauty with the dry stone walls and so on. But that doesn't need to be for 30, 40 million sheep. When Beatrix Potter set up her home in the Lake District and championed sheep, there was something like two million sheep in the whole of Britain. Now, now you have 30 to 40 million. There's been a massive increase since about 1850, and that's been true across Europe. And, and they would have declined due to economic factors, but they've been propped up with subsidies. The difference with other kinds of... So you of... wouldn't have a sheepless... No, I wouldn't like... have a sheepless... I mean, it's, I, I would have sheep, for example, in highly productive rotational arable systems in East Anglia. 85% of the food we grow in this country comes from just 20% of the land in East Anglia. And I think you can preserve soil and continue to farm productively by rotating crops and sheep. I think sheep have a really good role to play in certain rotational systems. In those lovely fells in the Lake District, you know, the, the, the tradition of keeping herdwicks, but you, you could have a 90% reduction in sheep, in my opinion. The problem with sheep is not only do they not provide a decent livelihood for anyone, even with lavish subsidies, they don't provide any public goods at all either. And the subsidy system in this country is now shifting towards a public goods-based system. You don't just get money according to how much land you farm any longer. A system, by the way, in which 50% of the subsidy went to the richest 10% of farmers. You know, ask Sheikh Mohammed in Dubai how much money he got under the old scheme each year. So the system is now based upon public goods. Native cattle on Dartmoor deliver public goods as long as there aren't too many of them per acre. So if you, you can farm in a way that delivers food, but also delivers all kinds of public goods, and you're now paid for those. Sheep do not deliver any public goods in the same but way. That's, you're not going to win the sheep farmers. It, it, John oh, well, wait, wait a moment. <coughs> OK. All those iconic landscapes, Brecon Beacons, mm. Scottish Highlands, so on and so forth, Yorkshire Dales, they're all grazed by sheep. <laughs> sheep actually play a role, OK, in maintaining those landscapes. That's one of their cultural contributions. See, sheep, one thing you can say about the British landscape, one creature you could say that actually belongs there is the sheep. Here's why. Neolithic farmers came along 6, 000, um, sorry, 6,000 years ago, basically raised most of the trees, stopped the forest from regrowing using two animals, cattle and sheep. When they did that, they created an amazing amount of habitats, British farmers. I say take, take a bow, British farmers, because basically when they arrived, Britain was mainly composed of two things, close canopy forests. Ben's going to say there's lots of wood pasture. We're going to disagree on that. But basically, they removed a lot of the trees and created all these other habitats. Heathland, for instance, looks wild. It's not. It's a creation of farming. The South Downs, lovely grassy expanse, created by farmers. North Yorkshire Moor, Looks wild, not, created by farmers and their livestock. These landscapes actually need sheep, not just for the niche places that Ben wants to put them, and here's why. They graze completely differently to cattle. They produce a different sort of sward, i.e. the turf. They actually do a kind of form of weed control, and this actually promotes biodiversity. There are animals that actually need that form of grazing. I mean, lapwings, for instance, like a nice view, sword short, wax fungi, skylocks, the whole lot, OK? So there are actually animals which actually depend on the close grazing of sheep. The perfect solution, Ben, and I'm very happy to see a reduction in sheep numbers, but you actually need the sheep, you know? One thing we need to actually establish, really, is that sheep are needed. They are needed because, actually, they promote biodiversity.
So it's really important to point out, I'm not for telling anyone how to farm. I'm not for telling anyone you cannot have sheep. I'm just interested in public money being used to deliver public goods. So farmers on Dartmoor, who overwhelmingly farm with sheep nowadays, 150 years ago, it was mostly native cattle, have been paid £200 million of taxpayers' money between 2011 and 2021. £200 million of your money. And that was under high-level stewardship scheme, which sought to recover nature on Dartmoor. During that time, there's not a single indicator that has improved. In fact, as if it were even possible, on almost every indicator, things have got worse on Dartmoor. Dartmoor, like the Pennines or the Yorkshire Dales or the Lake District or the Scottish Highlands or most of Wales, ranks among the most nature-depleted landscapes in all of Europe. It's utterly barren. It's millennia grass as far as the eye can see. No scrub, no trees, the odd meadow pipit. Imagine if a contractor was told by the NHS, we'll give you 200 million quid to restore this hospital. Ten years later, the hospital's in even worse shape and the contractor hasn't done anything to improve that hospital. It'd be on the front page of Private Eye. You know, it'd be an investigation by Unheard. It's a misuse of public money. So my interest is in seeing public money handed out to people who manage our land in exchange for public goods, restoration of nature, rebuilding soils, preventing flooding, storing carbon, you name it, amenity. There's a whole long list of 80, 90 things. So this is where the argument is currently happening. It's on Dartmoor. Do we continue to subsidise farming just for existing or do we subsidise public goods and allow farmers to sell those to taxpayers alongside the food they're selling in a private market? Sheep do have a role to play. The difference between sheep and cattle is that sheep is that sheep are not native. They come from Asia Minor. Now, someone said to me once that you know, sheep with their pointy little feet, it, it, uh, it's equivalent to going to a, a festival in stilettos. You know, they're not, they're not suited to the wet, miserable, cold English landscape. That's why 10% of them die of exposure every single year. You, you don't like sheep, do you, Ben? <laughs> <I'm, laughs> I, I, think she, I think the number of sheep is a real problem. I'd like to see far fewer. I'd like them if there were 90% fewer of them. John first. What should we be thinking um, as we go away? I, I still don't think you quite realise your trouble, the trouble you're going to be getting into when you reintroduce wolves, because although they're going to be put in the Scottish Highlands, they're not going to stay put. They will go elsewhere. I do not think you understand quite the social divisions that are going to be created in doing that, because it is definitely a feeling in parts of Scotland that rewilding is actually some sort of you know, programme for the removal of real working communities in favour of what look like private eco-Disney theme parks. Um, I think also what we really need to also, when we come back, um, talk about is maybe some of the kind of limitations of rewilding if you happen to be a farmer in the way it can actually stop you um, progressing conservation measures. Um, Because we're talking about um, basically pastoralism, but rewilding has an incredibly difficult job dealing with such things as arable farming because, of course, you can't actually rewild an arable farm, um, rewild an arable field, because it was never wild in the first place. So you always tend to get a very big silence from rewilding on a very large part of our countryside. So I think we might want to go there and actually look at maybe some of these sort of philosophical uh, limitations of rewilding. Ben? So, I mean, no one that I know or have ever heard of is suggesting rewilding productive farmland. Or People are talking about restoring streaks and patches of wild, self-willed, or, or at least semi-self-willed nature, repositories of nature in which natural processes are the main force. And that, if it's not going to happen in our national parks, you know, I don't know where it's going to happen. I think that the the issue we've got is that we've taken ourselves completely out of the miracle of nature, removed ourselves from it, and it's all about our dominion of it. And as a result, we have dismantled these natural processes and we assume that they don't exist. What the return of beavers to our landscape has shown us is that where we used to think that that, that, that nature is chaos and we bring order, we suddenly realize that in fact we've brought chaos. We've brought flash flooding and then drought in an endless cycle beavers have restored order to the hydrological cycle in each of the landscapes where they've been reintroduced. We don't need to have dominion and autonomy over every square inch. We can give autonomy back to Mother Nature, back to other species, and beavers are the perfect example. It's why I'm so passionate about beavers, because they're back in the landscape and they're creating these unbelievable 
cultural changes as well as these physical changes. So what I want is for us to reinsert our human systems back into natural ones with as little friction as possible, but understanding that there is friction and there'll always be friction, and the job of society is to manage that friction, which is something Sri Lanka does so much better than we could even dream of doing. 